here in the coastal city of Mykolaiv. Every promise of a ceasefire and the precious chance for people to reach safety has been broken so far. I have tears running down my face, although I'm a retired soldier. My wife was injured by shrapnel yesterday. She's now at hospital number four. She was just about saved there. Now she's there and I'm here trying to sort things out somehow. There's little optimism. Today's ceasefire will be any more successful. So as harrowing stories like that play out all across Ukraine, Ukraine's President Zelensky is pleading with NATO for a no-fly zone in his country. But the U.S. and NATO have firmly rejected that idea for now, which would likely lead to a ground war with Russia, which of course is a nuclear power. That is in addition to the U.S. also rejecting those plans for Poland to send Ukraine fighter jets through a U.S. base in Germany. Retired United States Marine Corps General Anthony Zinni served as Commander-in-Chief of the U.S. Central Command from 1997 to 2000. He joins me now. General, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you actually have the experience of running no-fly zones in Iraq during your time at Central Command. Explain to our viewers what that would actually entail if one was to be imposed over Ukraine. I think, first of all, you need to understand under what authority you're doing this. I mean, is this going to be a NATO operation? Is it going to be a coalition of the willing? Uh, you're obviously going to need bases. Who will provide those? The closer the bases are to the area you're patrolling, obviously, the more sorties you can generate, the better. Uh, I think you have to think through things like uh, what the cost of this is. It it's, means that we will have to patrol an airspace over a land the size of Texas, uh, combat air patrols, refuelers, AWACS, and maintain that for 24 hours. Uh, we, rules of engagement are going to be tricky. Uh, what do we do if an air defense system engages us, but it's in a civilian area? What do you do if a Russian airplane uh, attacks and then re retreats back to Russian airspace? Uh, how do we engage them? Uh, I think the most important question is, if we get into an engagement with the Russian aircraft or take out a Russian air defense system that engages us, that can easily escalate. So if a decision is made to install a, a no-fly zone, I think that the whether it's the NATO and, or the United States or both have to understand this could escalate into much serious, more serious uh, engagement with the Russians and eventually lead to war with the Russians. And we have to be prepared to react to that. Yeah, you raise a lot of very important technical and legal questions about that authority. And no-fly zones are, by their very definition, uh, acts of a conflict. What alternatives do NATO allies have to assist Ukraine? You've probably seen the debate at the top of this show uh, with the whole debate around fighter jets being transferred from Poland to Ukraine. That is also being, for the time, being rejected by the U.S. What else can the allies do to assist Ukraine? Well, I think uh, one thing that's being talked about is these humanitarian corridors uh, that maybe can be done under the, the United Nations uh, to ensure that uh, there's protection, uh, that UN is managing them with UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees, UN uh, relief agencies and aid agencies in place. Uh, and, and we could obviously say that it is a defensive measure. These corridors will be uh, aligned with routes that lead to places that we consider serve, uh, safe, like Poland and Romania and uh, other areas that we can evacuate uh, refugees uh, more easily uh, who feel comfortable in making that trip. So that's one option I've heard. But uh, short of that, uh, providing the weapon systems, the stingers, the javelins, uh, as many as we can, seems to be where we are right now. Uh, I don't think that this is going to resolve itself in the short term. Uh, so we need to look for long term options and how we deal with this uh, Russian aggression. Let me play for you a soundbite from the uh, Irish foreign minister and defense minister who spoke about um, the concerns he has potentially going beyond Ukraine. Listen to this. I think the NATO concern is the same as the as the concern within the European Union. If you start providing uh, Russian-built fighter jets that some of the countries on the eastern sides of the European Union still have into Ukraine, you are really getting involved in the conflict with Russia 
in a much more provocative way um, that I think may well extend this conflict beyond the borders of Ukraine. We are already providing them stingers and anti-tank missiles. You probably heard Ambassador McFall say there is no difference between those stingers and a MiG fighter jet. I'm curious, as a military guy, your thoughts. I mean, is there, there's, would it be a provocation to be sending MiG fighter jets into Ukraine? I think you have to think about what is involved in this. Obviously, where would we base them? Are we going to? Are they going to go into Ukraine bases, which may be uh, under threat? Are they going to operate out of uh, Poland or NATO bases, which obviously is a bigger commitment? In how we operate? Uh, obviously, the pilots will have to become familiar with those aircraft, even though they may have flown similar aircraft. They will have to be checked out. All the support systems for these aircraft will have to be put in place. So it's a large logistics requirement. It is a step a little closer to direct engagement because obviously this is going to be a NATO or EU or some combination of both uh, supported operations.